I've been doing, so I started last week with a four-week sermon series called Blessed Insurance. Last week, it was Get a Piece of the Rock. This week, Like a Good Neighbor. If you need to say State Farm is there, you'll probably get a kickback from them, but not from us. There's a definition for insurance. Insurance means a thing providing protection against a possible eventuality. The example that they give in the dictionary is adherence to high professional standards of conduct is excellent insurance against personal problems. I don't know whether you believe that or not, but some people think adherence to the law of God is excellent insurance against going you know where, you know when. We can say it here, can't we? We're in church. We can say hell. It's not about doing what's right to avoid hell. It's about responding to the grace that God pours into us in Jesus Christ that forgives us and makes all things possible. And so it's not insurance as much as it is a way of life. How many of you had heard this story before about the Good Samaritan? That's what we call it, although there is no mention of that in Scripture. He's not called a Good Samaritan. And that's kind of an insult in a way to say he's a good Samaritan because that implies that that's out of the norm. And for Jews it was. I cannot stress to you enough how much Jews and Samaritans despised one another. Despised one another. It was not a casual thing. It was the sort of thing that you taught your children how to do because these were their sworn enemies for such a long time. I always say to those of you who speak Harry Potter, those of you of that generation, the Jews considered the Samaritans to be mudbloods. When the Jews were carried off into exile, some were left behind. Some of those in the area of Samaria, although they claimed to worship the same God, they had a separate temple on Mount Gerizim. The Jews sacked that temple, and the Samaritans sacked the Jewish temple as well, desecrated it. And so this was a long-standing hatred of one another the kind that has to be taught. And so when Jesus tells the story, he tells it to a lawyer. And we always think lawyer. How many of you have a lawyer, an attorney? Not the same concept in the time of Jesus. Because the law, there was no civil law. There was no one who went to law school who passed a bar exam. In this context, it's someone who had studied the law of God, the commandments, and all the teachings around the law. And so, he asks a question to Jesus, and it's a good question. What must I do to ensure eternal life? What must I do to be saved? Jesus gives a good answer. What is written in the law? He puts it back to the man who's an expert in law. What do you read there? And he said, what a devout Jew still says every morning, the Shema, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, you got the right answer, do it, live. That's what all you need to do. All you need to do is summed up right there. But being a lawyer, God invented law. Lawyers and people invented loopholes. He's looking for a loophole. Who is my neighbor? Even in the the time when this was written, neighbor had certain connotations. When I say neighbor to you, what do you think of? Who do you think is your neighbor? person who lives on the right side of your house, left side of your house, cross street from your house, things like that, people who are close to you. Neighbor could mean kinsman. And so he could be justified in this idea, if I love my family, I'm off the hook. Or if I love those in my community around me. And who would a good Jew have for neighbors but other good Jews, not Samaritans? And Jesus says to him, as he's trying to justify himself, as he's trying to find that loophole, Jesus tells him the story that we just read. There was a man who was going from Jerusalem to Jericho. Have any of you ever seen what that road really looks like? It's worth looking up on the internet if you haven't seen it. Most people picture a road of their own understanding and their own familiarity and their own context. This isn't just a little country road somewhere. This is a road that goes along a cliff. This is a road with a very steep drop. This is a road where people often hid who wanted to waylay others, who wanted to rob them, who wanted to hurt them. It's also the road that connects Jerusalem and Jericho, which to us, that's just two cities in the Promised Land from the time of Scripture. But Jericho was the place where the priests lived. Priests were always of the 
the tribe of Levi. So there's a Levite and a priest, and they're going home, which means they're done their service. And the first one passes by the man, and then also the second one passes by the man. We sang this morning, Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry, while I'm on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. But these men passed by because, again, of a loophole. The loophole was that a priest, especially, or a Levite of the priestly class, if they touched a dead body, they would be unclean and have a great ritual to go through. The man appeared to be dead, and they could legitimately pass by on a loophole in the law. But there's a loophole to the loophole in this one that allowed if you were going to attend to someone who had died, you would not be rendered unclean. But it seems that they didn't want to take the time or bother to check on this man's situation, and so they just walk on by. Then you have the situation where the next man comes and renders him aid. Not just aid, but costly aid. It would be like one of you turning over your credit card to an innkeeper and saying, here, just charge whatever you need on this to take care of him. It would be like taking the medicine that you have, perhaps for your own needs, and giving it to them. Because oil and wine were the closest things we had to medicine in those days, oil that would soften his wounds, wine that would disinfect them because it's alcohol. It would be like giving up your last hand sanitizer in a COVID pandemic, or your last roll of toilet paper to a neighbor. It's giving things that are very costly to you. And Jesus says something that slaps this man right across his face. He was a Samaritan. That kind of hatred, I said, has to be taught. And I don't know how many of you saw when the Black Lives Matter rallies were going on, and especially around NASCAR and its banning of the Confederate flag, that people gathered outside Talladega wrapped in Ameri our Confederate flags. And one woman was recorded, and her video has gone viral. She was wrapped in the Confederate flag, looking at the black folks in the other side of the road with their Black Lives Matter posters, she said to them, I will teach my grandchildren to hate all of you. That about broke my heart. Because it's the same exact situation of the Samaritans and the Jews. Hatred that is taught generation to generation so that there will never be any common ground or any peace between the two. This isn't the only time Jesus will use a Samaritan as an example of one who does what is right, while the holy people the, the Levites, the priests, the people like the lawyer, the scribe, who was asking him the question, don't come off looking so good. There's the time when the lepers are healed and only one comes back to thank Jesus, and that one is the Samaritan. Even in John's Gospel, the woman at the well, the one who, unlike Nicodemus in the third chapter of John, who does not know who Jesus is, who comes to him in night, this is the woman who in the middle of the day Jesus says to her, I'm the one that you told me about. She said, when the Messiah comes, and this is the first time Jesus says to anyone, I am the Messiah, to a Samaritan. You can't understand unless you have also been taught to hate somebody because of who they are, what they look like, what their background is, what their race or religion is. You can't understand this kind of hatred, and I hope that those of us who are gathered here this morning can't understand that. But that is the context of the story we told. And it has great implication for us now, doesn't it? I know people are tired of hearing about racism, and I know people are particularly tired about hearing about privilege, because if I say privilege, what people say is, I grew up hard. I grew up without advantages. I grew up working my way through school. I grew up pulling myself up by the bootstraps. But that's not really what privilege is. Privilege comes down to numbers, that when you are in the majority, you have a certain advantage, whether you want it or not, whether you seek it or not, whether you take advantage of it or not, you have certain things that go your way. And that's what's happening in the world today, and that's what's happening in this story. Because a very important feature of privilege is the ability to walk by something you don't want to see if it doesn't touch you directly. And that's exactly what the priest and the Levite did. Jesus is saying, if you want to be a neighbor, you have to go the extra mile. It's what he taught in 
the Sermon on the Mount, exactly those things put into practice. Some people want to make this a story about Jesus being the Samaritan, the one who comes to heal our sins. While that is true, I think Jesus is not saying that exactly. I think what he's saying here is this is how you have to live. If you belong to God, if you belong to me, if it's my love that flows through you to the world, this is who you will be. You will love regardless of the person on the other end of the spectrum. You will love. You will extend grace. You will show mercy and compassion because that is who you are. Agape, that Greek word that means love. There are so many Greek words that mean love, but this one has a particular meaning, and that's the meaning here. It's to love like Jesus, which does not happen naturally or easily sometimes. It's an act of will. You will love regardless of what the circumstances are. It's hard, isn't it? It's hard to be a neighbor. It's hard to put aside everything that you've been taught or even some of what you may have experienced with people who are different. It's hard to push that aside, but we have the ability to do it through the power of the Holy Spirit, through Christ living in us and working through us and reaching out through us in love and compassion. It's remembering who we are before Christ comes to us. It's remembering ourselves and our sinful ways and how any way he accepted and loved us into wholeness. And Paul, who has a lot to say about sin and salvation, who has a lot to say about what it means to be in Christ, says what we read this morning, what Christina read to you, that everything can be summed up in loving your neighbor. The whole of the law and the prophets. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. So how do we get there? I was not born on the planet of loving everybody I met. I don't want anybody to think that. I was not this holy, holy, holy person, and I'm not this holy, holy, holy person right now. And my parents are at home saying, amen to that. They are. Trust me, they are. Hi, Mom. But when you meet Jesus Christ, when Christ comes to you, and you feel his love that transforms you and makes you new. It gives you courage, it gives you power, it gives you the command to love others. Even when you don't like them so much, or even if you've been taught to mistrust them, you can overcome that. We can all change through the power of the Holy Spirit working in us and through us. So we can be like the lawyer, at least getting to the point of saying, when Jesus says, which one was a neighbor? He can't bring himself to say Samaritan, but he can bring himself to say the one who showed mercy. We need to get outside our bubbles here. We need to understand that kindness to neighbor means what you're doing this morning, which is wearing a mask. I only took mine down because I can't preach in the sun with it on, and we're six feet apart, and I'm not going to face Christina right now. But wearing a mask, being kind to others. I've been asked to pray for so many people this week who have been exposed to the virus by someone who didn't think it was necessary to wear a mask, that this was all a bunch of hooey who has since tested positive for the virus. I've been asked at least six times this week to pray for someone who's scared about being exposed, and most of these folks are older, one in her 80s, who has been exposed by someone who said there's nothing to fear. Being a neighbor is bringing things to the thrifty penny because we have folks in our community who cannot make ends meet right now. It's finding ways to deliver food to the school system. It's finding ways to get kids who don't have a lot of support at home to be part of our virtual Bible school. It's by exercising kindness and exercising Christ in the world. Like a good neighbor, Jesus wants us to be a neighbor to others so that others might be a neighbor to us. Doesn't matter how we're treated in return, does it? Because sometimes you can put out the best things in the world and get nothing back but a hard time. I did a wedding for a couple years ago now. They were not members of my congregation. They were not members of any congregation. They said they wanted to get back to church at some point. And so I took that as a good opportunity to let them explore their faith. And I told them what I tell every bride and groom I marry. They need to find a scripture passage that speaks to their relationship with each other and the relationship they want to have with God. I can't tell you how many times now the passage we preached last Sunday about the wise man build his house on the rock. They want a firm foundation for their marriage. 
So I gave this couple a few weeks to think about it, and they came and they gave me this lovely passage, and I read it, and it was absolutely beautiful. And I said, you know, this is really nice, but you know this isn't in the Bible, right? They said, well, we couldn't find anything in the Bible we like. This is karma. Well, it wasn't exactly karma. It was sort of a take on karma, which says the good that you put out in the world is the good that comes back to you. They said, if you live your life doing nothing but good, nothing but good will come back to you. And I said, I wish that were true. I wish that were true. But Jesus, our Lord, did nothing but good every moment of his earthly life. He fed those who were hungry. He forgave those who were called unforgivable. He touched those who were called unclean. He healed people. He called them from their tombs. And he was nailed to a cross. The key to understanding neighborliness and agape, the love of God that comes to us in Jesus Christ, is that that's what you do regardless of what the world does to you in return. Because Christ is the one who directs your footsteps. Christ is your Lord, the Lord of what comes out of your mouth, what comes out of your wallet, what comes out of your heart. Which one was a neighbor, Jesus asked. The one who showed kindness and compassion. Go and do likewise. His message to that faithful man then, his message to those who are faithful now, that we continue to dig deeper and do more that we can to heal the world in the name of our Savior. Go and do likewise. Amen. Amen.